Good morning. Well, stand to our feet. Those of you watching online, stand up. Get out of bed just for a minute. Come on, hold your Bibles up. Say, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what the Bible says I can do. Today I'll be taught the Word of God, and I boldly confess my mind is alert, my heart is receptive, and I'll never be the same again. Never, 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 in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. What you say has an impact on what you do. So every time we do the Bible confession, it's not just some ritual or religious activity. It's actually telling our soul today, I'm going to get something out of this. And so you need to wake up every morning and talk to yourself. And it's not even cray-cray anymore to answer yourself. It's great. I'm, I'm a great conversational with myself. And uh, so you need to talk to yourself. And some of you need a Red Bull right now. You've got to pep it up a little bit for me, okay? Because I know some of y'all are already in, in like, like sooner mode. Boomer. You're real weak. They, they're not going to let you in like that. You're not even going to be able to buy a ticket acting that soft, all right? So anyway, uh, uh, yeah, so anyway, pep it up a little bit for me, okay? Because I got the boys up here with me today, all right? So we're talking about damaged goods today, and a lot of people say, well, I, I'm glad I'm not one of them. You were born damaged. I'm here to encourage you today. You were born jacked up. Don't leave yet. It gets better. I mean, when you start that low, it doesn't take a lot of effort to go up. You know what I'm saying? Because there are some people who think their life is perfect, they're perfect, their mom and dad told them they were. One of the hundred things I learned in my life is that I was not everything my mother said I was. Now, you may say, well, I was. I did everything stupid she said. But <laughs> she told me I could do anything I wanted, and I thought, I, I grew up, and I went, I, I tried a lot of things I couldn't do. And she had a lot of confidence in me and a lot of faith and, and uh, more than I had in myself. And so many of us are where we are today, thinking the way we think today, living the way we live, feeling the way we feel, because somebody told us this is how you're to live, how you're to feel, how you're to think. Or you simply put yourself in an environment or were born into an environment that made you who you are. Now, believe it or not, there is always that effect or impact on our lives uh, where we spent most of our formative years. Now, you don't have to stay there. Please get this. You do not have to stay there. But, but in my early years, I, I, my, my father grew up extremely poor, family of 12, uh, didn't have his per first pair of shoes until he was five years old. My mother grew up in a family of seven, not quite as poor, but poor. And so everything about my family was survival. And you say, well, that's not damaged. But it is damaged thinking if you know what the Bible says. <laughs> Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly, that, that God wants to provide and care for us. But I had this damaged thinking, and uh, that thinking was that this is just the way life is. This is who we are as a family, and it's never going to be different, and it's never going to get better. So you buy into that, and that becomes damaged thinking because the Bible says that we are called to go from one place of glory to another. We're called to live that abundant life. Now, in order to live an abundant life, that comes with resistance. In fact, many people who begin to press into Jesus and really try to strive to live the Bible have a more difficult time than people who don't. And here's why. When you are striving to obey God, you're a target of the devil. If you're apathetic, if you're lethargic in your faith... There's not a lot there to fight. I mean, you're just kind of mediocre, and Jesus did not die for mediocrity. And so our damaged thinking says, but I don't deserve better than what I have. This is all I deserve. I, I've done a lot of things. I've done a lot of things wrong. Now, some of you are incredibly sweet, and this message will not touch you the way it will touch a bunch of us damaged people. Yeah, it gets real quiet quick. So is he talking to me? Because I am just precious. I did burp out loud at the table one time. I, I'm sorry. You're so damaged. That was just an ordinary thing in my neighborhood. Anyway, so you, you would have been just fine. So turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 56, verse 1. I'm going to read this out of the Message Bible because that's what we do as preachers. We find those words in there that really fit. 
And I didn't realize this until last night, and I'd already prepared this message, and I'm studying again last night, and I went, let me just look this up in the Message Bible. It says, God's message, guard my common good. Do what's right and do it in the right way. For salvation is just around the corner. My setting things right is about to go into action. How blessed are you who enter into these things, you men and women who embrace them, who keep Sabbath and don't defile it, who watch your step and don't do anything evil. Make sure no outsider who now follows God ever has occasion to say. Now, let me read this again. Make sure no outsider who now follows God, which means they're on the inside, ever has occasion to say, God put me in second class. I don't really belong. And make sure no physically mutilated person is ever made to think, I'm damaged goods. I really don't belong. There are so many people in the world that don't know where they belong. They have an identity crisis, which means they don't know who they are. That may be the worst thing is to not know who you are. You might have grown up in a church that it wasn't about who you were. It was about what you did or what you didn't do. Many people do things that are not them. You and I have been bought with a price. We belong to God. We're created in His image and His likeness. That's who we are. We're created to do good works. That's who we're created to be. Now, oftentimes, that gets off track. And so when you read the Bible, it's very easy to turn Bible characters into Bible heroes. Now, there's a big difference here. A Bible character from beginning to end, there's often a story beginning with Eve. Now, Adam and Eve are in the Garden of Eden. They have everything they want. There are no malls. They don't have to do clothes shopping. It's a wonderful day. It's a Labor Day crowd. Yeah, we're sleeping in tomorrow. Anyway, so... Eve and Adam, at that point, get this, are basically perfect. And one day, as we know, the story goes that Eve is sitting around a tree. And most men only know a part of the Bible. Like, wives, submit to your husbands. You know, that's the great man line. Or, it was Eve that ate us out of house and home and garden. And, you know, Eve, I'm just telling y'all, y'all better ease up on Eve or she's going to be standing at the gate waiting on you. (laughs) Women, that was a really great time for you to elbow your husband and go, hallelujah. (laughs) And so, Eve, everything's great. The serpent comes in. And ask this question, did God really say that if you eat of the fruit of this tree that you will surely die? And, and so she begins to entertain and have a conversation with Satan or the serpent, okay? So that conversation leads her to question God, to question really who she is, who God made her to be, and what God had desired for she and Adam. She began to question that. And as we all know, she gave in and she ate from the tree. Now, the man is dumber than the woman. I mean, because the serpent was the craftiest in all of the garden. But the man, a woman simply says, you want a bite? (laughs) There wasn't even a conversation. Sure, honey. It wasn't like, I mean, she was, a, she was dealing with the serpent, man, this crafty creature. And the man just walks up and goes, whatever's for dinner is for dinner. <laughs> and in that moment, in that very moment, we began to be a damaged people. It began with two people making a decision to do things their own way. Now, God didn't kill them. They didn't surely die. But they were removed from the garden, not because God wanted to or wanted to have to do that. But in that act of disobedience came this consequence. And from that day forward, we have all experienced damage from that day. Now, it'd be easy. Religious people are going to live the whole life blaming Eve for their decisions. And this is what happens with damaged people. Damaged people are always looking for people who are responsible for the damage. 
And then once they find the person that did damage them, they want that person to fix them. Can I help you with something? The person who dented you is not a paintless dent person. They're not going to pop it out of you. They're the ones that put it in you. And so what happens in our lives, we remain damaged because we expect whatever damaged us to fix the problem when in reality God has sent his son, Jesus, and the power of his spirit to correct and fix the damage. We spend most of our lives living by default instead of by design. We default to our upbringing. We default to the school we went to. We default to the neighbors we grew up with. We default to the attitudes and mentalities that we were surrounded by as children, believing that life could never possibly get better. I think about so many people in the Bible, obviously beginning with Adam and Eve, and then, then I think about Moses. And Moses was incredible. I mean, what a story! What a story. He's put in a basket, floating along. Pharaoh's daughter finds him, picks him up, raises him. What a great life. Rescued, getting to live in this fabulous kingdom. And then God shows up. And he finds his destiny. He knew his destiny before he was damaged. You had a destiny before anything ever happened to your life. But the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy, and to damage, he can't take your life. This, this is what's very important. And I'm, I'm really trying to be encouraging today, and this won't be really encouraging. Because everyone in here is going to die at some point. I, I, I don't know how to bring this point home any other way. So here's what happens. So we live most of our lives trying to preserve a, a, a vessel, a tent, Paul called it, to protect it. When in reality... I'm going to tell you, I never had a wrinkle when I was 20. And there are days without Botox, I look like a basset hound. (laughs) Y'all just freaking out today. Let's go back to Moses, okay? (laughs) Probably be safe choice here. So Moses grows up, great Bible character. We remember Moses, why? Because he goes to Pharaoh and says, let my people go. And he faces the most powerful man of that day. And he goes in face to face and faces him. And you know the series of events and all the plagues that happen. And then all of a sudden, one day... Pharaoh lets the people go, but then comes after him, and then then comes Charleston Heston, or the wet, no, that was another one. (laughs) The Red Sea. So we see, let my people go. God uses a damaged man stuttering. That's his first damage. He couldn't talk. God gives him someone to help him. Then he leads the people out. Then he crosses the Red Sea. This is one biblical stud. But if you only remember that, you forget what he went through to get there. He killed a man, and then he ran from God. Moses was incredibly damaged. Now, here's what happens to damaged people. Typically, damaged people try to find someone else that's damaged, and then they compare their damage with the other person's damage. Well, I'm not as bad as they are. I've never killed anybody. Oh, yes, you have. If you're driving a car, you've killed more people than you can imagine. Now, maybe not physically, but in your head, you're like, you are the stupidest driver. I didn't know Walmart was giving out driver's license. I mean, am I right? This is how we respond, and we don't think anything about it, but that comes out of a damaged soul. And i got to tell you all, that's a part of my soul that still has a dent in it. And so I deal with driving. It's, It's like the one thing I have to do that I really have to think hard about and not let the damaged part of me come out. But we look 
for other people. Damaged people put other people down because they know they're damaged and they don't want to be the only damaged person or the most damaged person. So we look at people who are incarcerated and, and we look at, well, you know, they're in prison. They're worse than me. I don't know about that. They just got caught. Or they did what you were thinking. See, the, the challenge in our lives is that we, we, we have to, to, to face our deficiencies and our damages, our damaged lives. I grew up in a, a really wonderful home, but it, my, my, it, it was full of fear. It was full of fear because of the poverty of my parents' past. They worked hard to provide for us, and, and, and I, I watched, and, and because we didn't have as much as somebody else, and I had wonderful parents. My mother and father were Christians, but they... They had this fear, and they, if anybody got ahead of us in, in a home or somebody got something new, it must have been because they were crooked. Gets in your head. That's damaged thinking. Just because somebody else is blessed doesn't mean they're bad. And, and I remember constantly living in that fear, and it damaged my soul to think anybody who was wealthy must be a bad person. That was how I grew up. And so, but something in me when I got born again started to address the dent in my soul and that damaged thinking. And I began to think if, if they can, why can't I? Because I read the Bible and it said God doesn't show favoritism. And he said all I had to do was obey him and I'd be blessed in the city and the country coming in and going out. I'd be the head and not the tail above, only and not beneath. Though my enemies come at me from one direction, they'd flee in seven. Now all of a sudden I'm reading the Bible and the Bible went against what I had seen my whole life. Now you have to at that point make a really difficult decision because it separates you from your parents and children who've had good parents oftentimes say, I, I can't violate what they've always believed. My mom and dad were Baptists, I got to be Baptist. My mom and dad were Lutheran, I got to be Lutheran. In all in honoring your parents in reality, and I'm not criticizing those two denominations, don't send me an email. I'm just old enough to not care. Because here's the reality. We are who we are. Why? It gets quiet. Why am I the way I am? Why do I think the way I think? Why do I behave the way I behave? Why do I always, why am I critical? Why do I gossip? Why do I do those things? Because it's what you got used to. And anytime you do those things, it is a sign of a damaged soul. Something in me has a deficiency, and that deficiency has damaged my ability to live the life that God wants me to live. My dad looked at me one time, and, and, and I was the guy that they, one time, I'll never forget, my mother said, everything's fine until you walk in the house. You know, no, 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 you, you, you want me to, you want to feel sorry? Don't feel sorry for me. She was right. Now you say, well, that's a cruel thing to say. It really wasn't a cruel thing. She spoke the truth. We don't speak the truth in our country anymore. Everything has to be PC. If we started really living the Bible and people really started telling the truth, we would all be sharper. Why? Because we would have to grow and face our deficiency in our damaged lives and grow up. If somebody looks at you and says, that's just stupid thinking, you say it's politically incorrect. Yeah, but you're still stupid. We don't talk that way. Read the Old Testament prophets. Bro, even Jesus in Matthew 23. Jesus looked at the Pharisees and says, you brood of vipers. Come on, Jesus. But nobody talks about it. It's like, why would Jesus do that? Because Jesus loved them. So if you go home, ladies, and say, your husband, you're a, you're a viper. <laughs> you better only do that under the unction of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said it in love, saying, your religious behavior is nullifying my power. You're damaged, and the only way you're going to get fixed is quit following the laws and the rules and follow the one who gives life. I got groceries up here. This box is pretty mangled, wouldn't you say? Damaged. I used to work for a grocery store. And every night after closing, we had a crew that would go up and down the aisles and they would pull all the damaged boxes of cereal, canned goods, 
And then they would take those and they would put them in a basket. And sometimes two or three baskets filled. And on the baskets there would be a sign. 30% off, 40% off in this basket. Now, being Americans, we like the beauty of the can or the box. How many times have we gone to the grocery store and there are cans on the shelf and somebody dropped this one, knocked it off, it's dented. And then we look and which one do we grab? We grab the one that has no dent. It's not been damaged. Guess what? The pears in this can, just as good as the pears in this can. Some of y'all have been dented, and people have criticized you, overlooked you, put you in a clearance basket, and you allowed it. And because they put you in clearance, you lived a clearance life, 30% off instead of 100% God. And you have lived your life in the shadows of your destiny instead of the light of it because somebody told you you're dented, dinged, and damaged, and you can't ever be anything. But let me tell you, whoever the sun sets free is free indeed. You are whole, and he makes us whole. It's what's in here. It's according to the power that's in us, not outside us. Some of you raised by an addict. Some of you are an addict. Some of you were abused. Horrible things. Some of you have been damaged in the way you think physically, emotionally, mentally damaged. Divorced five times. First evangelist had had five husbands. She wouldn't have a ministry today, but she won more people to Jesus than either you and I ever would because Jesus didn't see her as damaged. Remember the woman at the well coming up to Jesus, and Jesus is having a conversation. She, I mean, this woman was brave. She's talking to the man. And Jesus goes, you've had five husbands, and the one you were living with now is not your husband. She looked. She could have said, how dare you? Are you Sherlock? (laughs) How dare you? How dare you call out my damaged life? How dare you address my mistakes? How dare you? Who are you? Who do you think you are? She didn't. She listened. And she leaves that conversation rather than being like most American people who had already filed a lawsuit for defamation. He hurt me. He said dirty things to me. He made me feel dirty. He made me feel bad about myself. Now that woman went, that dude told the truth. She went to town and said, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. That's when you know she might have looked damaged, but the content of her soul was good because she didn't let it get her. We all have a story. I I come here every Sunday. Just my relationship with the Lord is different than it's ever been. I don't live it through ministry. I live it through everyday living. Sometimes in ministry we get caught up trying to tell you all what to do when in reality we're all jacked up. We're just trying to share our jacked upness (laughs) and how we deal with our jacked upness. (laughs) So I have a great platform for jacked upness. And when I thought I'd never preach again, It didn't bother me at all. I said, God, I'm good with it. He said, I'm not. Just because you're dented up, I'm not taking you off the field. As a matter of fact, your dents will help more people than your perfection because you've never been perfect. And I went, okay. You see, judgment is a sign of damage. The Bible tells us not to judge or we'll be judged. It's a sign that someone's damaged. When you judge someone else, it's a reflection of the own, your own soul that you're still damaged. You see, it doesn't matter what people say to you or about you, really. I mean, we should all be kind to one another, and we should all tell the truth. But we should tell, tell the truth with great compassion and love and, and, and really... Hurt with those who haven't told the truth. That's, that's the plan. That's God's best. And so, but what happens is, when we get damaged, we get defensive. We go inward. And we start excusing our behavior because somebody hurt me. 
I had a situation. I didn't choose to be born at this time into this family. I didn't choose these things. And some of you have excused your destiny and your future by referring to your past and your hurts and your damages. It would be very easy. I've heard hurtful things. As a matter of fact, this message comes from the platform of a conversation I had with a man in June of 2014. Right after all my world collapsed and you have all these friends. And this was like one of Job's friends. I'm convinced it's from that lineage. And I love the guy to this day. I love him with everything in me. He has really, truly been a great friend. And maybe even what he said, he needed to say. But I'm having a conversation with him, and I can tell you where I was sitting. I was at May and Northwest Expressway at Office Depot. You don't think words have an impact? I remember I could take you to the parking spot. And I, it was two months after all my world collapsed. And he looked at me, not looked at me, I'm on the phone. He says to me, you will always be damaged goods. Obviously, I've never forgotten those words because I could tell you where I was and where I was parked. Now, I didn't allow those words to stain my soul. But I kept those words to remind myself that I'm bigger than your words, and God's word trumps your word. That day, he said, my gifts and callings are without repentance. They're irrevocable. Now, at that point, I didn't want to hear it, but over the years now, I keep going back to this. I'm not here to prove anything to you or the world. I'm here to prove to God, regardless of criticism, regardless of harsh words, I'm going to be a blessed, joyful, happy camper, and I'm going to follow Jesus to the ends of the earth, regardless of what the world thinks. Now, listen, we love Moses. He killed somebody. Oh, and then there's precious little shepherd David. We love David. We do. All preachers talk about David and how wonderful. And he killed a lion. He killed a bear. It got him ready to kill the giant. And he just was a servant. He played musical instruments. He was so, well, he was just diverse. He was awesome. And I love it when preachers talk about David that way. But they never really talk about all of David's issues. David's worse than me. I didn't kill nobody. Now, you see, we laugh because the reality is we all preach about David, but David couldn't get a platform today if he was here. That sucker couldn't preach anywhere. But he was a man after God's own heart. That's how we see David. But you see what I'm saying? He was damaged. But David did not allow the damage of that moment to keep him from the destiny of God. He got up after his son died, took a shower, cleansed himself, and said, give me something to eat. It shocked his servants. What, what's wrong? And David looked and said, you know what? He can't come to me, but I can go to him. David said, I will not give up. I may be damaged. I might have been down a while, but I am back, and I am in a place that God told me to be, and I refuse to quit. When you are so damaged that you, you use that as a tool or advice, say, God, I, you know, I know you don't want to use me. Stop. I can't be an usher. I've been married five times. You probably helped the usher who's been married three No, in the old church, man, I mean, you couldn't preach if you'd been divorced. You couldn't do any. I'm just telling you, we had rules and regulations and the traditions of men, Jesus said, nullify the word and the work of God. We've thrown people to the side, kicked them to the curb. At one time, my first church, I had three ex-convicts on staff. No, I hired them. Why? They're people. You say, well, what if they steal? So what? And one or two did. <laughs> one of them I fired, and I said, now I expect you to be in church on Sunday. And he did. I said, I ain't turning you in. I ain't making you go back. I believe in you, the God in you. He's never done it again, at least that I know of. <laughs> I'm real big on second chances and Snap, crackle, pop, rice, krispies. 
These boys have been making it for years. They're a little dented right now, but inside here, you pour some milk on that, they still sing to you. <laughs> Snap, crackle, pop, rice, krispies. <laughs> it's damaged. Why not? Some years ago, I was dumb enough to buy a chopper. Extended forks, no shock. The back tire was about this wide. It was. It, was, it made me a lot cooler than I really was, <laughs> which is why I bought it. But I started riding it, and you know, we we could use some road repair in Oklahoma. Dear Jesus, this is like the wild, wild west. And so I'm ride, I ride this chopper, big, long. It was hard to ride, and I've been riding motorcycles my whole life. But this one was really hard to ride, real high, extended forks. I mean, it, no shocks, but it, ha- it sounded amazing. Matter of fact, I, I just leave it running and go to sleep. <laughs> and I decided I just couldn't do it anymore. My spine was suffering <laughs> I guess when you get older, your nerve endings are more sensitive. I, I don't know. But I just decided I got to get rid of this. And I called a, a, a friend of mine who owned a bike dealership. And I said, man, I, I got this chopper. It's just beautiful. It's custom built right here in Oklahoma. It's amazing paint job. Everything's awesome. He looked at it and said, okay, I'll trade you. And I, so I got this. It was an old man bike. <laughs> I don't have it anymore, by the way. I, I just couldn't do it. I'm sorry. I'd like to. I'd like to I'll, I'll take a little pain for cool, Okay. So I went back to my old ways. But anyway, I, I, I called him, and I said, uh, we stayed in touch, you know, and I called him about the bike I got from him. And, and he said, uh, I said, you, did you sell my old chopper? He said, well, yeah, I did. I said, well, I'm just curious. What kind of guy bought it? Because I thought, you know, some burly old Harley guy, you know. I thought some cool dude, you know. I don't know why Harley guys look good with kegs. <laughs> Have you ever noticed that? I mean, they're like huge. Am I the only one that sees it that way? Because I'm just telling you, there, there's, that, there's that stereotype. You know, it's just like uh, the, the tattoo that says, I love mama, looks better on them than a kid that's a computer expert. First off, the kid's computer expert can't fit it on his arm. But anyway, so <laughs> I'm sure there will be a stud walk up. I do computers, and I'm going to break you in half. Anyway, so, so I said, who bought the bike? And he said, you're not going to believe this. He said, but a, a wounded warrior soldier bought it. He, he was missing his one arm. I said, oh, come on, man. I said, I had two and had a hard time riding it. <laughs> so I guess nobody told this guy, you can't ride it. You got one arm. He said, no, what we did was we retrofitted it. We put, we put the, uh, the clutch on the accelerator side, one hand where it was, so he could accelerate and put the clutch in and shift. And he said, that's all we did. And he said, you should have seen him. It was amazing watching him ride out on it, that it was like he had two arms. He said he just, he just shifted, he did everything. What am I saying? I'm saying this guy had every reason to be pitiful and pity himself, but he said, you know what? I may be damaged and lost an arm, but it's not going to keep me from living the life that I want to live. That's a physical damage, but most people, what I'm talking about today is you have soul bruises and soul damages, and words have hurt you, and they do hurt you, and and the prayer would be that today you would see that all of those words may have been truth to the person who spoke them, but they don't have to be true to you. We've all had things spoken over us. We've all had difficulty. We've all been damaged. We've all been hurt. Some people have been dinged a little, but maybe not really dented. So the dinged up people look for somebody who's dented. We feel better about ourselves. What we need to start doing is the reality is nobody can fix you but you and Jesus. People are not going to apologize to you and come and pop the dents out of your life. They're just not going to. And, you know, I'm not even sure they should. Really, I used to think, well, you need that. But then I came up with a saying a couple years ago, a few years back. My peace is found in my forgiveness, not in your apology. If you're waiting for someone to apologize so that you can have peace and be whole again, 
God may make you wait a long time because you don't need their apology to be everything Jesus has called you to be. So you don't have to wait on it. Should they apologize? Sure they should. But that's going to be between them and God. And any time that someone needs to repent or apologize and they don't, it's storing up in their soul. It's another dent in their soul. It's very easy now for me to say I'm sorry, and it wasn't prior to five years ago. I have no issue, and I'm not talking about I'm sorry I knocked your milk over. You know, everybody apologizes for little things that are little sins, but when you make a big one, that means the apology is bigger. It takes more. And if you want to be free and you want to get the dance out of your soul, you're the only one that can do that. You say, well, I've never served before because I didn't know I could. I've never really taken communion before. Like my dad would not take communion the first five, ten years he got born again because he was still smoking. He hadn't been living for Jesus. And, and in the church he was in, that was, you know, that was a big, big sin. And I'm thinking, well, I think gossip's probably hurt more people than secondhand smoke. Thank all you smokers. <laughs> I'm in trouble today, huh? Anyway, I, I say that only because we as a church have measured people, not by their potential, but we've measured them by their problems. And every one of us has problems. So why don't we start looking at potential and speaking to potential. And sometimes speaking to potential means telling a hard truth. I'm not telling be flowery, fluffy. I mean, sometimes somebody may need to get in your business and say, you know what, you're just wrong. And you know what? If you flare up at somebody who tells you you're wrong, it tells me you're damaged. If somebody tells me I'm wrong, and somebody says, you know, let me investigate that, you could be right. No, I, I, why, why not? It doesn't make me mad. <clears throat> it used to make me mad. It doesn't make me mad anymore. I said, you know, it's possible. You could be telling, you could be right. I could be wrong. I'm okay with that. Now, it's not fun all the time, but most of the time I don't care because, you know, the reality is when you've been through everything I've been through, being wrong is no problem at all. <laughs> you just look and go, I've been stupider than I am today. <laughs> Today's a good day. This is little stupid, mini stupid. This is not maximum stupid. <laughs> I've been maximum stupid. I know the difference. So, I love those many days because, you know, you're going to have many minis. We just hope you don't have a lot of maxis. And when you can laugh at your own self and you can laugh and go, yeah, I was dumb. You know, I can look at people incarcerated today and judge them all I want, but really I should be, I've been in jail at some point in my life. And from probably about 18 to 22, I could have been in jail for any number of reasons. I just didn't get caught. Now, I know that scares some of you. Our pastor's damaged. <laughs> One pastor looked at a lady and said, what did you think of the sermon today? She said, it was really good. We didn't know what sin was until you came to town. <laughs> I don't know whether to take that as a compliment or... <laughs> I just got good news for you today. It's not about all the dings, the damages, the wrinkles, and the scars on the outside. It's about a heart that wants to pursue God. The can of pears that's dented, it's just as good as the can of pears that's not. The box of cereal with my buddies on there, the damaged box is as good as the one that's not damaged. Nobody's better than you. Maybe some people behave better. Maybe they behave differently. But every one of us are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image and likeness of God. And yeah, we get damaged from time to time. And yeah, we make mistakes. And yeah, we hurt and we hurt others. And we damage and we damage others. And I just want to say this to you. Do what Moses did. Do what David did. Do what Saul did when he became Paul. And get up. And keep on going. Because greater is he who's in you than everything that's happened in your world. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your grace. We would all be in hell without it. We would all be doomed without it. We'd all be hopeless without it. God, help us. 
when we are damaged, when we are hurt, when we are wounded, to run to you, to cry out to you instead of simply crying. You're an awesome God, faithful God, and all of mankind is flawed and damaged and wounded and hurt. We just all wear it differently. Some people hold it, act like it never happened, and they live their whole life secretly damaged, crying themselves to sleep at night. I pray for those people that they would realize that the person to their right and left is damaged. But maybe they admitted it. Maybe they spoke it out. Maybe they sought help. Maybe they cried out to you. May we all cry out to you, God, because we're all damaged. But you use damaged goods. You use damaged people. I'd like for everybody to keep your heads bowed and eyes closed. I want to pray a prayer, and I want to ask you to pray it with me. And pray it with those who have never prayed this prayer to ask God to heal the hurt, to deliver them from the damage, to give them strength to face it every day, confront it instead of embrace it. To not hold bitterness and unforgiveness in your heart. It will kill you. I want to ask everyone to pray this prayer with me. Say, Father God, thank you so much for sending your only son to die on the cross for my sin. Jesus, thank you for giving your life for me. Today I give my life to you. I repent of my sin, and I declare today I am forgiven. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Well, if you prayed that prayer to recommit your life to Christ or to give your life to Him, I want to ask you to text the word SAVED to 405-500-1310. Why do we do that? Because the reality is that in that moment, your profession of faith gets to us, and we are able to pray over you, for you. But more importantly, it's going to be the most powerful text you've ever texted in your life. Today, what you're saying to all, I I believe that your text is going to go through the corridors of hell. And Satan is going to have to see your name born again, bought with a price, covered by the blood. And then that comes through there and out, and you are free. I want you to text the word SAVED to 500-1310, 405-500-1310. Do that? Okay, good. This time, I want to receive our tithes and offerings. These people aren't mad at me. They're just working. Some of you go, well, I'm going too, bless God. Yeah. You know, I've never ever had an issue talking about the offering of money because Jesus didn't have an issue and the Bible didn't have an issue. The people who have an issue with it are people who typically are outside the church convincing people inside the church it's a bad idea. But God himself said giving and tithing is a good idea. He didn't say it's optional. It's like the Great Commission wasn't the great suggestion. And giving is the same way. He said, if you'll bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, I'll open the windows of heaven and pour out such a blessing, you won't have room enough for it. Today, I want to encourage you, more than anything, just to be a giver, be a tither, be faithful, be consistent. You'll watch God change your financial world as you do. If you're writing a check today, simply write it to Mosaic Church or just Mosaic If you want to give by text, you can do that by texting 405-546-2226. 405-546-2226. And you can set it up on a debit card or credit card. Very simple to do. If I did it, trust me, you can because I am not technologically savvy. And uh, But that's the easiest way to give. I We got paid the other day, and I, I was laying in bed, and I went, oh, man, I forgot. So I just got up and texted my tithe in. Uh, it just makes it a lot simpler. Also, you can give online at mosaicokc.church uh, any way you want to. So, ushers, go ahead and pass the buckets. While they're doing that, let me first say to all of you who are first-time guests, thank you for being here. Uh, you are amongst damaged people, but they're really good people. And uh, we just uh, doing life together. That's why we call this Mosaic Church, is that God's taking a bunch of fragmented pieces of humanity, putting us together, and creating a portrait for His glory. And that's what this is all about. And so uh, we thank you. We have a gift for you as you exit uh, just to the right, the welcome kiosk. And uh, please pick up your gift. We thank you for being here. Also, this Wednesday night, everybody listen, this Wednesday night is our first family fun night. It's going to be very simple. We're going to have the whole band here. We have some extended worship. 
in faith believing I'm going to speak for 20 minutes. I will do my very best. But it would be about 7 to 8, 8, 10. And then we have Big Truck Tacos going to be here. Uh, so we'll have food and fun for the whole family. So you want to be here Wednesday night for sure, okay? That's this Wednesday. Also, the end of October, we're doing a big outreach on our property along with Incredible Pizza. They're going to be a part of it all, but we're opening it up as an outreach. So when I say this, please get this. The Weekend All-Stars, two of the players on Weekend All-Stars in that band that's all over the city, they play in our band. Great guys. We're having them come to do the music that night in the parking lot. We're going to have cars decorated, and we're going to reach into our community and, and reach a lot of people. So put that on your calendar, October 27th at 6 o'clock that evening, Sunday night. You can be here, uh, record whatever stupid, I mean, game is on that night. Um, Anyway, we want uh, to make that a big night. So thank you for being here. Let's stand to our feet. We're going to go out with a shout of hallelujah. I love you all. Hey, listen, have a safe day tomorrow. Don't be foolish, okay? Seriously, it's, it's Labor Day and people get crazy. So be, be chill, all right? Be chill. All right, let's go out with a shout. One, two, three. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.